Okay, good afternoon. Good to see a lot of people here. A lot of excitement around Kubernetes. Please uh, raise, your hand, raise your hand whoever is using it or downloaded Kubo, installed, or just Kubernetes. Okay, got some people there. Okay, so this talk, um, we know there's a lot of excitement about Kubo, and if you really don't know what Kubo is, we can explain it. But there's a lot of excitement about it, and generally, uh, Kubernetes uh, in the CF community, which is great. Two very strong communities, uh, both embracing multi-cloud. And um, what I really wanted to do with this session is actually explain what those different abstractions are, how they can actually play well together, what are the best use cases or the best workloads to deploy each, and actually how we can make this all work at the end, right? And um, hopefully we're going to see some good demo coming out of it at the end as well. So uh, let's try to save the questions to the end, but if there's anything that can't wait, uh, for you just uh, raise your hand and I'll just call out. So what's, what's the concept for, for, for Kubo and what's the concept for Cloud Foundry? Um, been using Cloud Foundry for quite a while. Been in this journey since uh, VMware days, pretty pivotal. And, um, once, once you've been there for a while, and once you, you look at what Cloud, became, Cloud Foundry became all those years, and all the customer abduction use case we have, we can realize that companies have many, many, many different ways to package run their workloads in the cloud today. Right? If you're just looking for the greenfield applications, you can see most customers building uh, microservice workloads, Spring Boots, definitely, a clear um, standard, de facto standard in market for those workloads. Um, but people also have their own containers. Um, a lot of times those are coming from ISVs. Uh, we've seen that people who actually ship in their software as tarballs and zips, and then sometimes just FTP servers with the source code they compile. Uh, a lot of those uh, third-party software, third software vendors are now just, in a way, Docker images. And I would talk to customers, and they're like, what am I supposed to do with this? And those are just not like single, very simple images that you can just self push. A lot of times, they require stateful storage. Those are just clustered workloads that expose the specific ports, and they use those specific ports to actually make uh, the cluster awareness work. Uh, customers also have their old batch-based uh, batch workloads. They have data services that are all going to be stateful and clusterized most of the times. Uh, they do have the monolithic applications, right? And we've all been there. And monolithic applications, a lot of times, are just being replaced by new apps. But a lot of times, they're, sta they're stable enough, and they're just going to be there. And some customers just want to lift and shift and keep them on the cloud for some reason until they refactor that to maybe brand new Spring Boot applications. Um, and we now have customers talking about event-driven functions how it can actually trigger uh, those functions based on specific events and how support architectures like what AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, for example, are doing. And if you look at all those workloads and we see the vast major the large number of abstractions that are available in cloud today, of course, we have infrastructure as a service uh, underneath it all. Somebody can just get a VM and install everything and everything will work fine. But we have different abstractions that all run on top of infrastructure as a service anyway. We have containers as a service, or CAS, uh, application platforms, used to be called PaaS. And with now with this serverless, we have serverless functions or functions as a service. So where am I supposed to actually deploy this, and how do I choose between either? So let's just start to take a look at very clear on those abstractions are, right? Starting to the very left, um, we have just containers or containers as a service. They're usually orchestrated on a container orchestrator platform. And basically, the main abstraction there, the main unit deployment is a container itself. So the developer provides a container. And uh, actually, all the tooling or the platform does is scheduling that container and providing primitives for network, routing, logs, metrics, and additional common services you would need. It just provides primitives. There's a lot of uh, do yourself here. 
and we'll get to their own examples, right? Their application platforms, this is the next level. Instead of um, worrying about building a container yourself, and actually everything that goes inside a container, what those dependencies are, how do you build a container yourself, how to keep it updated, how do you actually update a component inside it. Once there's actually a security patch to be applied, the component that goes inside the container is your responsibility to do it. If you don't want to handle all that, you can just give a platform an application, usually search code or binary, and then the platform will take it from there. It will actually build a container for you. It will schedule that container to run. And you provide full-fledged services that will actually support that container. And that it's very clear the Cloud Foundry experience that we have today, right? Just give it an application, I'll make everything else work. And then we have serverless functions that we provide an even smaller grain, where we provide just an application function, a part of the application, any specific rules that when it would be triggered and what you want to do with that function or the context around that function once it's triggered. And we'll leave that for later on and we'll focus on this talk on those first two abstractions. And of course, any of this runs on top of an infrastructure as service, IAS, which actually a lower level abstraction underneath it all. Um, we're also going to realize that as you go more towards the right, you lower the complexity for development usually because you actually, the developer is responsible for a smaller grain. And if you take just the two of them initially to compare, why are you initially responsible for building a container yourself and everything that goes around it if you want to deploy it to a container orchestrator? If you're targeting an application platform, you just worry about the application. So less complex and you actually have higher efficiency. It's easier to enforce the standards because the platform is building a container and enforcing those standards for you. Exactly taking care of updating the containers if needed. But if you need higher flexibility or higher desire for customization, you might want to do some of those pieces by yourself. And specifically, if you're getting a pre-built or pre-packaged application for an ISV or from somewhere who already built a container, and just want to run that container, maybe that problem is already solved, and all you want to do is to schedule that container and run. Or if you actually want to put everything on an application platform, you'll see that as it takes care of building that container and doing all that work with networking and disk and everything for you, then it might be a little bit more constrained on the workloads you can put there. And that's not going to fix 100% of the workloads. So there are trade-offs you consider here. A different way to see that is if you look at like concentric circles, you can see on the very bottom hardware, and I can deploy anything to a hardware. You want to go bare metal? I can deploy any workload there, right? If you go a little bit to the top of that, maybe I can fit 90% of the workloads on infrastructure as a service through provision of VM. And then maybe 70% of the workloads you can do in infrastructure as a service you can fit in a container. So basically, um, the restrictions on what you can run there goes towards the top. So you can actually fit less workloads when you move to the top. But as you move that up, um, but we also move up, you actually lower the development complexity. It's easier to enforce the standards. And you have higher operational efficiency as well because the platform operates more, automates more. Um, and how does that really work when you look in a company portfolio, enterprise portfolio, all the applications that they have and all the workloads they have to run in the cloud? Well, if you want to leverage the best tool of the job, your, your strategy might be push as many workloads as possible or technically feasible to the top of this hierarchy so for the ones that fit right there, you have the most efficiency. And whatever doesn't fit there, you can actually deploy to the lower, to the actually to the abstraction immediately below it. Um, all of this is just to say that those are different abstractions. It's specifically a container as a service and an application platform. And we're going to see that this relates immediately to Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry. And not 
a single tool is going to fit all the workloads. They're just different abstractions. And most, uh, most companies would actually need more than one abstraction for, for the workloads. And I think it's our job as people helping implement it to actually help them choose the right tool for the job. That's um, what we're trying to do here, right? So let me hello to Megan, who's going to talk a little bit about what the operational challenges of our, any platform that you might want to choose. Yeah, so no matter what platform you choose to run on for any specific workload, there are operational challenges with those platforms. And we found that a lot of the challenges are similar across platforms. Uh, we break them up into two categories. First is day one, which is deploying the platform itself. And some of the common challenges we have there are multi-cloud, so you'd want to be able to run on any cloud environment. Um, you might have specific ties to one cloud versus another. Um, and also having a consistent setup across clouds is important. So you could, um, you could actually have multiple clouds running the same platform, and you'd want them to per perform in the same way. Uh, and then open APIs is an important challenge as well. If you want to be able to automate how the platform deploys, for example, in a CD pipeline, you would need open APIs to be able to do that. And then setup time. Of course, we'd like to set up fast, not in weeks, but maybe hours. <laughs> um, day two is operate, operating the platform once it's already deployed. Uh, so if you need to make updates to the components of the platform, like there are patches or upgrades to those components, or if you need to scale it to meet uh, changes in demand, you'd like those things to happen automatically and with minimum manual intervention. Um, we think that if you don't have, if you have to manually intervene a lot, you are kind of reducing the benefits that you're getting from the platform by running on a platform in the first place. Yeah, I, I usually say that also anytime you need to have a manual intervention, and we do have a lot of uh, cloud platforms that people need to leverage a ton of scripting and run books to install, to update, to upgrade, to do any kind of experience. I think it's not only that it's going to reduce the, op the operational efficiency. We have talked to customers who have teams of 40 to 60 people to operate a small platform. That's not changed the status quo. But I think more important than that, anytime you have manual intervention, you actually add impossible errors. You actually add in lags on updates. Every time we need to stop for a week to apply a patch to install a security update, or maybe to upgrade something that's actually launched at each three months, you not only add complexity, you not only add that time, you also been behind on a version for a week, and we've seen recent security issues and everywhere around our, in uh, our industry, there's also a huge security problem here. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so let's talk about the specific platforms that are the titles of our talk. Uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime. So if you're someone who's saying, run this app for me, I don't care how, this is a good place to run a workload like that. 12-factor um, apps, like Fred mentioned, are really good to run here. Um, so the platform itself will build the containers and manage them for you and make sure that they're up, always up to date. Uh, logging and monitoring and um, you know, metrics, tracing, these things come pre-configured so you don't have to do any additional configuration. And you can get services on demand. Uh, my team at Google actually built the GCP service broker as well. So you could uh, provision like a spanner instance and bind it to your application very easily. Um, and it has fully automated ops. And the way it does that is by using Bosch. So Bosch is an open source tool for release engineering. It does um, deployment and management of distributed systems. Um, and it does a lot of the things. It takes care of a lot of the challenges that we talked about on the previous slides, um, like scaling, uh, upgrades, things like that. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention it does is health monitoring of the servers and processes of the distributed system. So if a VM if one of the components of your platform dies, it will bring it back and make sure that you have the correct state. I, mean, I think we can arguably say that actually Bosch is the platform here. Uh, Bosch is the one that actually stems up everything, watch everything you're deploying, make sure it's healthy, and make sure that when you do an update, you have no downtime, and you can actually patch things on the fly, and everything works right. Uh, smoothly, right? Yeah. But that's the operational control. And the, pl the platform in this case, or the distributed system, would do similar things for your applications that you are running. Exactly. Kubernetes. So if you're saying something like, run this containerized application, uh, let me tell you how, then Kubernetes is a good uh, platform for you to use, or container orchestrator. Um, 
It's ideal for packaged applications. Um, like Fred mentioned, ISV package it, packaged apps run really well here and easily. Uh, or things that use persistent storage, like MongoDB, or we're going to show an example later with Elasticsearch. Um, and things that just need customization. So if you need to specify how your app is deployed and operated, um, like let's say you have a specific networking need or something for your application, um, maybe you need to expose multiple ports, this is something you can do on Kubernetes very easily. Mm -hmm. um, Kubernetes has a lot of the same challenges we talked about before, um, scaling, and then health checks and healing. It will do that, again, for your applications that you're running there. It'll make sure that you have the correct number of um, pods, they call them. Um, and it'll do health checks of those, but it won't do it for the nodes themselves. Um, so if you have a, one of your worker nodes dies, it won't recreate it for you. Um, and then high availability is important, too. So there's no high availability of the Kubernetes API out of the box. Um, and upgrades, of course. We need upgrades easily yeah. for and quickly for security reasons. And correct me if I'm wrong, because um, Kubernetes was first created inside Google. And it was created like that because it's actually relying on Borg mm. for doing all the high availability of, of the masters and ETCDs and to do a role upgrades and make sure this all works mm -hmm. uh, smoothly operationally. So if you're deploying that by yourself, you actually need a layer to do that. Right. right, and that's actually perfect for the next slide. That's why we started working on Project Kubo, which is a Bosch release for Kubernetes. Uh, so it provides a uniform way to deploy and manage highly available Kubernetes clusters, and it works on any cloud um, as Bosch works on any cloud. Uh, it does, basically it just uses Bosch to do all of these things, to deploy and um, to manage the cluster once it's, de once it's deployed. Uh, this is a project that my team at Google and Pivotal started working on in December, and then it was donated to the Cloud Foundry Foundation in June at the last CF Summit. And now it just became Cloud Foundry Container Runtime right, it's as this morning, right? I knew I was going to forget to say and we that. Just, we just changed right here quickly the logos to say Cloud Foundry Container Runtime. Right. But that's, that's Kubo. Yeah, so it's now Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, Cloud Foundry Application Runtime. Exactly. But Kubo is easier to say, so <laughs> shorter. So it, it becomes really um, retrieval to understand that once they talk about application platforms, that all developer needs to provide is an application. It's specifically, if you're targeting workloads that will run well on the Cloud Foundry application runtime or the Elastic runtime, as you want to call it, just provide the source code or the binaries. And the platform will make sure to build a container for you, to manage the container for you based on the build packs. It's a great model. Because a developer can actually push a workload that's going to work on the, any of the build packs provided. And from an operational point of view, the operator can also constrain in what workloads or what stacks it actually does support inside the platform by the, the build packs. And those are actually there. Those are the, 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 the kinds of stacks of workloads that do support. Uh, but if you want to go beyond and actually push, just push your own containers, bring your own containers to the cloud, and schedule them. I'll make sure those are safe, those are secure. I'm going to patch them. I'm going to actually build those containers, or ISV is doing it. Or if you need to specify anything uh, more specific, you can just use Kubernetes managed by the, single, the same infrastructure operational control, which is Bosch, deploy now Kubo or Cloud Foundry container runtime. Yes. Right? And what we did at Pivotal, um, we looked and say, well, if you really wanted to provide an enterprise class product uh, based on this container runtime to our customers, there are a few specific um, components missing, right? If you actually want to use a container scheduler, you probably want a container registry that you can actually use as a private registry and provide role-based control and register your image there and do security scans all that image. And that's something that's missing. The other thing we mentioned is the container orchestrator provides some primitives on how to do a few things. One of those primitives, for example, is networking. If you use Kubernetes before, you know that the Kubernetes networking model is super simple. Flat network, everything access, everything. And if you want to do multi-tenancy, and if you want to do role-based access control for networking, if you do want to do network micro-segmentation, if you want to provision load balance to the fly, you have to need a node network overlay that does that. So you need software to find a network on top of that. 
So we partnered with VMware that was actually very interested in the project, worked with us from an engineering and, and product management point of view, uh, that could provide some of those components. And that's what we've been calling PKS, or Pivotal Container Service, which is basically uh, Project Kubo for, for enterprises with um, a container registry called Harbor. Um, it's an open source project from VMware. Um, NSXT, software defined in networking, multi-cloud, multi-hypervisor that overlays on top of the Kubernetes networking. GCP service broker, so you can actually take that Google Container Engine experience if you leverage, for example, Google Machine Learning APIs and actually bring that to you anywhere you go, even outside of GCP. And just a control pane. And that control pane is extremely important because we figure that there are some customers who really want to have one Kubernetes cluster and slice the dice uh, they give to different tenants as they wish, as other Kubernetes distributions already do. But there are some customers who are actually interested in having many different Kubernetes clusters. Maybe I'll have a different cluster per tenant. Maybe I'll have a different cluster for environment. Maybe I'll have a different cluster for a specific set of applications that behave uh, similarly. So with this, you can actually have a service broker API that you can say, hey, um, PKS, give me a Kubo cluster or give me a Kubernetes cluster and I need, let's say, two masters, two ETCDs for nodes. Oh, give me a cluster and I actually need to bind it to this specific availability zone. So with basically the controller, you can provision, deprovision, scale clusters as you wish and it provides a nice API that you can call it from the Elastic Runtime or Application Runtime now uh, service marketplace, so it can just become another service, you register there. Or you can call for a command line if you're just deploying PKS yourself. Or you can call it from your continuous delivery pipeline and make it a continuous delivery a Kubernetes cluster and upgrade and update experience, right? So this is what looks uh, an enterprise uh, version of Kubo, it uh, would be calling PKS, right? The other interesting thing that comes out of the Google partnership is um, we understand also that for customers being running the latest and the greatest Kubernetes version uh, is actually a big deal. Uh, Kubernetes releases very frequently, uh, at least three months, maybe less. So make sure you're always running the latest and greatest is not only about updating that continuously, it's not only make sure you do rolling upgrades without downtime, it's not only make sure that you have security patches and updates available as soon as they are available. It also means that we have uh, Google, at the, which is uh, contributing with most of the engineering of Kubernetes, looking and say, this version is well hardened and is ready to go for an enterprise customers on GKE. Exact same time, we're going to actually roll that out to PKS. So we're constantly compatible uh, on the Kubernetes versions. So workloads that runs in one place, it's going to run another one. Um, Okay, so we mentioned about Kubo. We mentioned about Kubernetes. And how would those things work together? That's a big question. There are a few very interesting integration points here. The first thing I mentioned is that we have the controller. The controller would allow you to call and provision and operate Kubernetes clusters from either a command line, a continuous delivery pipeline, or from the CF marketplace because it implements the Open Service Broker API. That's a big deal. Uh, you can have provision your own Kubernetes clusters at different plans on your marketplace if you have Elastic Runtime. The second important thing to mention is you can actually have integrated networking and routing. So there is a specific component on the Kubo project called CF Route, route Sync. Sync. OK, yeah. got it right. Uh, that when you actually expose a load balancer in Kubernetes, if you tag that image with some specific tag, it creates a tag on the Go router on CF. So the exact same way that you push an app to CF and you get a link, my app dot my apps dot my company dot com, for example, you can get the same by pushing your Docker image to Kubernetes. And that's something you don't get from Kubernetes out of box without that. You got to expose balancer, you can get an external IP. For now, you can actually get a route in CF. 
uh, which is really cool. Yeah, I was going to mention too, if you're already used to using the typical Kubernetes routing features, those also work with Kubo oh, yeah. deployed clusters. So what's a typical usage scenario? What's, what's a typical use case? And, and, and that's, that's what we are going to deploy as a demo, right? We can see um, as, a, as both platforms working together a single Bosch layer. Uh, that Bosch layer is the multi-cloud layer, is the operational control pane, is ever make sure those workloads are running, um, health checks everything, roll upgrades everything. It can have two Bosch deployments here, for example. You can have one that is basically the elastic, ri elastic runtime or the application runtime release. And you can have the other one, there's the Kubernetes release or Kubo deployed by Bosch. And those are going to be all running in Bosch. And then you can have, for example, just um, your Spring Boot applications. Or in this case, we're going to be leveraging Spring Cloud Data Flow, which is built on top of Spring Boot. Um, running, for example, in your Elastic Runtime or an application runtime. And let's say if, if, if you're not used to Spring Cloud Data Flow, it's uh, built for integration pipelines. And um, I'm, we're going to show it soon. And usually integration pipeline, you read data from somewhere, you do a few steps in the pipeline, maybe parsing data, splitting that data, and you're reaching some content, doing some transformation, and then you lend the data somewhere. You write it somewhere. It's a very common use case to write to, for example, Elasticsearch cluster. So you actually create index and make that, that data searchable. It turns out that Elasticsearch needs multiple ports to be exposed. It turns out that Elasticsearch is cluster aware. It turns out that most of the times you want to have stateful storage. So it's something that really doesn't fit well to the Elastic runtime. So why don't we have our Spring Boot applications <coughs> run the best place they could, which is the Elastic runtime, and then we can have Elasticsearch cluster running on Kubernetes and both things work together. And that's, that's what we're going to Set up now. Yes. Let's go. So first thing we're going to do, we go, and we have the Kubernetes cluster, and we don't have time to do it here. We're basically going to um, deploy um, a new container, just do a kubectl run out of Elasticsearch image that we have. I spell it right, yes. Let's do a kubectl and see if we have the pod's running. Oh, that was fast. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we also have a Maven server running there. Nice. Elasticsearch is running. Let's create the indexes. It's still coming up. See a few seconds. Let's hit it again. There we go. Okay, there we go. So this, if, uh, this script basically uh, does a curl that goes to Elasticsearch and create the index that we're going to use. We're going to take a look. It's a curl that just inserts and describes what the data is before we can insert it. So we can go to Kibana and just make it aware of the index we just created because we're going to see a visualization of the data we're inserting there live. And we're going to import the dashboard that we created just to make it pretty. And what basically we're going to do is import, get some workload, get a data set with the earthquakes that happened around the world in the last month. So hopefully see some really nice hot spots in the map. Uh, we're getting this from ANSS, who actually uh, provides the data in the US. It's a file. So let's go to Spring Cloud Data Flow, deploy that pipeline, and you can see the Spring Boot microservices doing it. Yeah, we can also look at the... Yeah, text let's text open the file to take a look. Just, it's just, just a text so file. So see we're not faking anything. Just so it's just a bunch of data, uh, CSVs, separated by a star, each line. So what we're doing in Spring Cloud Data Flow is saying, um, hey, I'm going to deploy this pipeline, and let's open it to see what it is. It means at each 3,000 milliseconds, so at each three minutes, um, create an event. Out of that event, we're basically going to do an HTTP request to gather that file. Next step, we're going to split it by star. That means we're going to split the lines because they, didn't, they have a star instead of a line character. And then we're going to persist to Elasticsearch. And this custom Spring Boot, the Spring Boot application that we created is basically going to uh, persist to 
that route that was synchronized with CF. Once you deploy it, we now see four apps starting up. And before they're running, they look like trash. It's normal. <laughs> so let's uh, click it again, refresh it. Instead of one app, we should now see a few running. So each step of that pipeline is just a microservice deployed on CF. If you click on service on the tab, each of those is actually bound to a RabbitMQ server. So the first step creates a time and posts that to RabbitMQ. Second application takes that input from RabbitMQ, makes a request to HTTP, takes the result, pulls back to RabbitMQ. The third step takes that, that thing, splits on the stars, puts back to RabbitMQ. The last one takes it, persists. So it's a pipeline built out of Spring Boot microservices backed by a RabbitMQ. That could be backed by Kafka, too. It seems to be running now. Um, let's open that earthquake map that had no results. Data is starting to come. Let's wait for a few seconds. There's actually a ton of data. It's super quick. Let's refresh it a little bit. Yeah. Data is coming it's more. Harder. And if you actually go directly to Elasticsearch, you can actually count and you can, you can do a refresh. Oops. There's an extra dash. Yep. And then you can do a count. We can see now we have a little over oh. 4,000 objects. Good. <laughs> we do it again in a few seconds. We might see 6,000. It's counting. And it's basically going to start uh, keep pulling data around. Um, pretty simple to set up. Basically, deploy Elasticsearch to Kubo or to Kubernetes. Kubernetes, make sure it's working. You're already managing that image yourself. Keep that image running. Deploy an application to, PK, to uh, Clown Foundry runtime. You can either use the external IP you exposed on that service on, on Kubernetes or just use the route that it was created in CF automatically if you integrate the routing. Just use that as a router, use the same router, goes there directly, persists the data. Um, I think we might have five minutes for any questions from the audience. Do we have a microphone to handle? Sure. Cool. Chris, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Question right here. Checking that this works for you. Hi. Yes. Um, does it work with the CF networking um, interface? So can you um, use private uh, Cloud Foundry apps without any routes? Or I'm not sure if I understand the question. Like, just just say it again. Let, let, let me see if I get it. And does Kubernetes work together with the um, private? Um, apps, for example. Mm -hmm. what, so do you want to isolate the networks, what are you saying? So you can, you, can you work, uh, do you have to expose um, a route or something on yeah. Kubernetes too? If you want to use the Cloud Foundry routing, you have to set it up with our route sync job that we built. Yep. And then you have to tell, well, we just use a, a label right now. You just label it and say, I want to have a route named this, and then it'll automatically add that to the Cloud Foundry routers both the Go router and the TCP router. Yeah. So there's a job looking. So Kubernetes, you deploy something, and you get private IPs into your network. That's what you're saying, right? And then you need to go to kubectl and do uh, exposed deployment. And then you would get, for example, using a load balancer, you'd get an external IP load balancer. So once you do that, if you have the Cloud Foundry route sync and you tag your image correctly, that's going to actually take a route and synchronize with the Go router. So you're going to have Go router forwarding to that external IP, right? Yeah, or it no actually, you don't have to have an external IP. You can just have a node port, and it'll just node port, forward doesn't it need to the, old the answer. internal IP of the worker node. And, and then the, the route sync integrates both things. Yeah, you don't so need you to do it. you can still have private. You absolutely don't need to do it. It's just to yeah. make if you want to use the name of the routes. Can I get the clarifications? Is that the only way that a Cloud Foundry Elastic Runtime app can connect to the Kubernetes apps? Uh, absolutely no. not. You can expose them um, using external load balancers on Kubernetes services and then contact them using that and IP address. Exactly. And then you're going to have an external IP address. Okay. Yeah. For that, you need to have a dynamic load balancer set up. That's something NSXT can provide. That's something you're running on GCP. You can use the GCP external load balancer. 
Oh, if you're using, yeah, yeah. GCP. Uh, what's the forecast for uh, Run C and Volume Manager plugins, basically, with container runtime? I mean, Run C is already able to run OCE images. There was on tra um, to work with uh, Volume Manager plugins to be able to have like some stateful, uh, you know, block devices inside the container. So does it mean that uh, container runtime with uh, pull apart the, the work that has been done on Run C and Volume Manager plugin? On I don't know. The only volumes that we support right now are um, like the native cloud ones for each cloud that you run on. So I think we support GCP persistent disks, um, okay. vSphere persistent disks. Um, I'm not sure about that specific. Okay, but there, maybe there is no point in asking the question uh, right now. But we, yeah, I, this is being currently being developed, so uh, we expect to have a GA product uh, by December, by late in the year, um, and I'm happy to give any updates uh, for that. Actually, can I ask a question on that? The, the, you mentioned persistence interface when you went off on your sort of yeah. proprietary product tangent. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we're going to have second class persistent features in the open source and all the good stuff will be in the proprietary product? Um, no. What is, or what was the persistent so. interface that you referred to? Um, I think we can take this directly to the Kubo project managers, but the, the idea is to actually uh, to have a fully working Kubernetes open source managed by Bosch as part of the open source. And a lot of the open source goodness uh, plugged into that as Kubo. And what we're doing as part of PKS, like you said, it's basically adding NSXT for now uh, and the container registry and everything else will likely go to Google. But I, I'll, um, we can ask Colin, which is the product, product manager, directly that. Probably have time for one more. Hi. There's another Hi. session. I have here. one question. So I know all of this uh, integration between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes kind of comes from the bottom up, you know, Kubo, Bosch, managing both of them, that's clearly a topic for service providers, but as a customer, uh, the developer side of all of this, right, um, when I heard today about Elastic Runtime, Container Runtime, kind of coming both out of Cloud Foundry, my first thought was that maybe this means that in the future the CF CLI and the kubectl CLI will kind of merge and I will have all of those capabilities at my fingertips at a single place. You know, I like the orgs in space concept, give me that on top of Kubernetes when I do a Docker image deployment, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to doing build pack deployments. Is this where this could be going into in the future? I think those are two questions in one. So let me answer the first part of it. Uh, the idea right now is to keep using kubectl as the developer interface to talk to Kubernetes. Uh, that's what most of the Kubernetes community endorses. That's what they want. That's what works best for most of the companies we talk to. Um, and it's just operational, it just works. A lot of people already have that script and, com and they have to continue to deliver pipelines. Um, as to talking about more about the integration of like, oh, I want to have this on my spaces and orgs and CF. I like how multi-tenancy is done, for example. Uh, that's where the service marketplace comes really handy. Because you can say, okay, only the developers that are on this org and this space can actually have access to this plan of the service and can provision this cluster. And once this cluster is provisioned, if it's bound to the specific space and org, it only has the visibility within that space and org. So it becomes a multi-tenancy division by itself. Um, you can all do that with the name says and Kubernetes if, if, if you prefer to do that way. So I think it gives a lot of flexibility and possibilities. As we said, as it's a project and a product under development, I think we're still figuring out a lot of those things, and we're taking more customer feedback to see what's the best way going forward. I think we have to leave the room because there's another talk in here. All right, thank yep. you very much, everyone. Thanks. Appreciate it.